In this video, I'm going to show you how you set up a Django app and deploy it to a server running on AWS using Docker Compose. This is going to be quite a lightweight deployment. All we're going to be doing is setting up a Docker Compose file that will allow us to run the code in a production type environment. The benefits of this is that it can be quite quick and easy to get up and running and it has a fairly low overhead because you don't need to manage lots of different servers or lots of big infrastructure to run your service. If you have a small project and you just want to get it online so that users can view the application and play around with it, then this is the deployment method for you. I should mention that there are some drawbacks to this deployment method. It's easier to deploy, however, it is more difficult to scale. So if you're going to be scaling your app to have like many thousands of requests per minute or something like that, then you may want to try a different deployment approach, such as using um, App Engine or ECS Fargate or something like that. So you can scale up your Docker containers as you need. But this, as I say, is just going to be a lightweight deployment that you might use if you just have your own project that you want to get up and running or you just want to be able to demo your project to other users on the public internet. In order to get started, you're going to need Docker installed, a code editor, a GitHub account, and also access to AWS. So we're going to be using a server that is available in the AWS free tier, but it's important that you take responsibility for any payments that are accrued on the account. Technically, if you follow the tutorial exactly, you shouldn't be charged for any resources. However, there's no guarantee. So it's always important to check which resources you're creating in AWS and see if there is any cost associated with that outside of the free tier. Before you get started, you're also going to want to make sure you're familiar with SSH authentication. So we're going to be using SSH to connect to GitHub and also to connect to the server that we're going to be using. And then we're going to be using it to pull the code from GitHub to the server. So we're not going to cover in detail how to use SSH authentication. I'm assuming that most people probably already know how to use it. However, if not, don't worry, there's a link in the resources of this video to a GitHub tutorial that explains how it works. So you can set up your GitHub account with SSH. So let's get started. We're going to start by creating a new project on GitHub. So if you open up your GitHub page, we're going to go ahead, make sure you're logged in, and then we're going to create a new repository. So I'm going to click on repositories. And we're going to create a new repository specifically for the app that we're going to be deploying. I'm just going to call the repo something like Django Docker Compose Deployment. You can, of course, call it whatever you want. Maybe you already have an existing project in mind that you want to create. But we are going to be creating a Django project from scratch so that we can demonstrate things like handling media files and things like that on the deployment. You don't need to enter a description unless you want to. You can make the repository either public or private. I'm going to be showing you how you can deploy a private project using a deploy key. In most cases, you're going to want the code to be private because you're going to want your application to be just private to your organization. However, if you're creating an open source project or something like that, then you may want to make it public. I'm going to leave it public just so it's easier to share with you guys when I'm done. So I'm going to check the box for add a git ignore and we're going to choose the python git ignore file. This is a python project we're creating. Then I'm going to check the box to add a readme and then click create repository. Once the repository is created, we can go ahead and clone it by copying the SSH URL and head over to the terminal or if you're on Windows, you might use PowerShell or git bash. And then you're going to change the location you want to clone the project to. So I'm going to put mine in document slash workspace, git clone, and then paste the URL. This will go ahead and clone the project to our local machine. Now we can switch to the project. And I'm going to type code dot to open it up in Visual Studio Code. I like to use Visual Studio Code. But of course, if you have a different code editor that you prefer to use, you're welcome to use whichever editor you prefer. So now that we have the project open in Visual Studio Code, the next step is to set up Docker in our project so we can go ahead and create a Django project that we can use to test with. I'm going to create a new file in the root of the project called requirements.txt. This is going to list our Python requirements that we're going to need to install in the Docker image when we build it in order to run our project. So the main requirement we're going to need is a Django. So I'm going to type Django more than equals 3.2.3 comma less than equals 3.3. If you head over to PyPy, the Python package repository, 
then you can find the current version of, uh, of Django that's available and you can get the versions and all I'm doing with the syntax here is making sure that we have the latest patch version. So if any security patches or anything are released, it should automatically be installed. But then we won't install a version that is equal to or higher than 3.3 because that could contain breaking changes. So we want to be able to gracefully upgrade our project and increase that version as and when we wish. As I was saying, if you go to PyPy and you type in Django, you can see the Django project here and it's currently 3.2.3 is the latest version. So now we'll head back to our code. We'll make sure that the requirements.txt file is saved. And we're going to create a Docker file in the root of the project with a capital D. And then we are going to add to this Docker file. I'm going to start by basing it off the Python 3.9 Alpine image. So if you go over to Docker Hub, which is hub.docker.com, and if you search for Python, click on Python, you can see that there are various different tags available. And we're going to be using the Alpine tag. So if you search for Alpine, Alpine is a very lightweight base image that's recommended for Docker. So you can see it has various combinations here. I'm going to be pinning it to the most specific one that is uh, not a patch version of Python. So I'm going to be using 3.9 Alpine 3.13. So we go back to the code, we type from Python colon 3.9 hyphen alpine 3.13 and again I like to pin the versions here because that means we have the most stable and um, reproducible experience so if you use the same version as this then it will ensure that the steps in this tutorial are as similar as possible even if there are new versions being released sometimes if like a new version of python or a new version of alpine is released there may be some changes you need to make to the docker file so I recommend using this specific version that I'm showing you on the screen here now, which is Python 3.9 Alpine 3.13. Now I'm going to add a label, which is best practice to set the maintainer. I'm just going to set it to our website. You can, of course, set it to whatever you want. Then I'm going to type env Python unbuffered one. And all this does is it says when you're running our application, we want Python to print any outputs directly to the console. So it doesn't buffer the outputs, which can create issues with logging and things with Docker. So it's recommended when you're using Python in a Docker container to always set env Python unbuffered one. Now we're going to copy some files. So we do copy and we'll copy requirements.txt. Oh, so turn off caps lock here requirements.txt to forward slash requirements.txt. Then we'll do copy forward dot forward slash app to forward slash app. So what this will do is it will copy the requirements file that we created to our Docker image at forward slash requirements. And it's going to copy the app directory, which we're going to create right now. So if you just create a new folder inside the project called app, this is the directory that's going to contain our Django source code. So when we build the image, we want it to copy the current version of the code that is in the app directory into the image so that it can be used when we run our application in the deployed environment. Next, we're going to type work the forward slash app. And this tells Docker that the working directory of new containers made out of the image should be at the forward slash app directory. So effectively, it will be like doing a CD forward slash app every single time, except you don't need to do that because it's automatically working from that directory when we start the container. This means we can run the Django management commands directly in the container without having to specify the full path. Then we'll type expose 8000, which will be the port that we're using to connect to when we run our Django development server. I'm going to show you how we do that in a minute. Now we're going to type run, and I'm just going to tell you what to type out here and then I'm going to explain each line after because that might be the easiest way to understand this block. So I'm going to type run python for uh, hyphen m v e n v forward slash p y two and signs then the backslash and then indent to the same level of the line that you're currently typed python at and type forward slash pi slash bin slash pip install hyphen hyphen upgrade pip two and signs and then the backslash again forward slash pi slash bin slash pip install hyphen r forward slash requirements.txt 
two more and signs, and then a backslash, and then add user, hyphen, hyphen, disabled, hyphen, password, hyphen, hyphen, no, hyphen, create, hyphen, home, and then app. So the run line, or the run block here that we have, runs a command when we're building our image. So it's a list of different commands that we're going to run, and you could specify them all on their individual run line. So you could do run this, then run this, then run this. The reason we put it all in one line is because Docker will create a new image layer for every single run command. So if you want to reduce the number of image layers to keep the Docker images as lightweight as possible, then you can add all of the run commands on one line and separate them by this double and sign backslash. And what this does is it just says run this command and this command and this command and this command, but it does it all in one layer. So when you change this layer, it will get rebuilt. But if you don't change anything in this run command list here, then that layer stays the same. And also it doesn't create multiple different layers, um, one for each line that you have. So it just makes the images a bit more lightweight. What each command does here is the first one, Python hyphen M, uh, venv forward slash pi will create a virtual environment inside our docker image for storing our python dependencies now some people think that you don't need to do this and in some cases i don't do this either however i find that it's useful to do it because it does help separate the python dependencies from any dependencies that might be on the alpine image so technically there shouldn't be any dependencies on the base image because it's a lightweight image that doesn't come with any dependencies for Python pre-installed. However, just in case there are, just to avoid any conflicts, it's useful to be able to put them all inside their own virtual environment, which we're creating here at the forward slash py location. Then we call the pip install upgrade command, and we call it by specifying the full path to the pip executable inside the py environment that we created. And we do that because we haven't added it to the system path yet. So if we just did pip install hyphen hyphen upgrade pip, that would upgrade pip on the version of pip outside of the virtual environment. We want to ensure the virtual environment has the latest version. So we specify the full path. Then we specify the install command in the same way by specifying the full path inside the virtual environment. And we install the requirements file that we previously copied here on line six. Finally, we add a user and we set it to have a disabled password, which means there's no password login for that user. And we also say don't create a home directory for this user because we don't need this user to have a home directory. And the user name that we give it is just called app because this is the user that is going to be running our app in our container. If you don't do this line, then what will happen is your app will run as the root user. And that's not recommended because if somebody compromises your application, then they'll have full access to everything inside that container. If you do add it as an unprivileged user such as app, then if, the, if an attacker does compromise the application, at least they will only have access to whatever that app user has access to. So it's just a security precaution that is recommended whenever you're creating an application that's going to be actually deployed. Now, below the run line, we're going to type env path equals, and then open up these double quotes here, forward slash py forward slash bin, and then a colon, and then the dollar sign path. And what this does is it adds our uh, virtual environment at py, at forward slash py to our system path, which means whenever we run a command that uses Python, it will automatically use the Python inside our virtual environment. And this is what we want when we are running our container, because when we run our app and we manage dependencies and things like that, we want to be doing it from our virtual environment. So we don't want to do it from the version of Python installed inside the Alpine image. So basically what it means is if we run any more commands that use Python, we don't need to specify the full path here because it's already been added to the system path. Next, we're going to type user app. And all this does is switches the user from the root user, that is the default user we're logged in as, to the app user that we created on line 15. So anything else that we run after this last line will be run as this app user instead of the root user. And again, this is just to make sure that any application we run inside this Docker container is running as app and not running as the root user with full privileges over the container. So save the file and now let's move on to the next step. Next, we're going to go ahead and create a Docker Compose file for running our development server. 
Now this is just going to be for development of the application and it's good to have this on hand because presumably whatever application you build you're going to want to develop it on your local machine and to do that it's useful to have a development server that runs and that is different from the production server that we're going to be creating later. Go ahead and create a new file in the root of the project and call it docker-compose.yml. Then we are going to type version colon and then in quotes 3.9 and then services colon and the service I'm just going to change the spaces here to two if you um, haven't done that already I recommend doing that just to make the file a bit easier to read underneath services I'm going to add a new indentation and then app colon and then build colon and then context colon dot and I'm going to explain what each of these lines mean after I've typed it all out then below the build or level with the build line we're going to type ports colon hyphen 8000 colon 8000 and then volumes colon and then hyphen dot forward slash app colon forward slash app. So save the file. Now I'll explain what each of this does. So the top line, this is version. This is the version of the Docker Compose syntax that we want to use. It's best to use the latest version that is currently available on the Docker Compose documentation. And this just ensures that if Docker Compose is updated and it uses new syntax versions, it knows what version you intended to use with this file. Next, we have the services block. So this is the services that are going to make up our development environment. We only define one service so far, and that is the app service that we define on line four. And the first two lines of the app service, so lines five and six, are the build and then it sets the build context. And all this does is it tells Docker Compose to build from our current directory. So the context um, with the single period symbol or the symbol, single dot says just work from the current directory that we're running Docker Compose from, which means it will by default pick up this Docker file here that we created in the root directory. Later on, I'm gonna be showing you how we're gonna use a different context for something else. So it should make more sense when I show you that. Then we have the ports mapping. So this line here on 7 and 8 says map port 8000 on the container to port 8000 on the host. So our machine, our um, development machine is the host and the container running the application is the container. So we want to be able to map the port so we can access the application via that port from our local machine when it's running inside Docker. Next, we have volumes, and this specifies a volume mapping from our local directory with the app directory here to the forward slash app directory on the system or on the Docker container. So when we're running our application in our development server, we want it to automatically receive any updates we change in the code directly in the container. So if we make a change to our source code, we want that to be reflected in the container immediately so that it will auto refresh the server. So then we don't have to manually restart the server every time we need to test a change. And this is only needed for the development server because that's when you'll be making changes to the code and you want those changes to be immediately reflected in the container running your application. For the deployment one that we're going to be creating later, we're not going to need this line because we're going to build our image in one go and we're only going to be rebuilding it anytime we do a deployment. So we don't want it to necessarily automatically update the code. I'll show you what that means later on in the tutorial. Next, we're going to create a docker ignore file. So create a new file in the root of the project that's called dot docker ignore. And I provided a link in the resources of this video so in the description of this video there should be a link to a sample docker ignore file and that looks like this so you have all of these items here you're going to copy the contents and paste it in and then save the file and all this does is it says exclude certain directories from the docker build context so whenever you build your docker image it's going to gather everything that is in the current context which is in the current location and it's going to copy it into the container and access it as part of the build process. However, some of the files, such as the git directory with all of the git hidden files in it, git, git ignore, um, any hidden files, and then the app pycache, things like that, we don't want them added in the build context because it just slows down the process and they don't need to be inside the container. So we create the docker ignore file and list all of these files out so it just makes our containers a little bit faster to build and it also prevents us from accidentally copying stuff to the container 
or to the image that shouldn't be there. Now we're ready to go ahead and actually build our image. So if you go ahead and open up terminal or if you're on Windows, it will be either git bash or PowerShell and type docker hyphen compose build and then hit enter. This should go ahead and build our Docker image. So we'll see whether we define everything correctly in our Docker file in a moment. If there are any typos or errors, then they should appear now because the build would fail. It seems to be working so far, so we'll just see if this works successfully. We'll just wait for this to finish and then we'll continue. Okay, so that appeared to build successfully. So now we can go ahead and use this Docker image that we created to create a new Django project. And we can do that by typing docker hyphen compose run dash dash rm app sh hyphen c and then in brackets here, I'm just gonna move the screen up here so you can see it. There we go. And then in the brackets at the end, we're going to type Django hyphen admin start project app and then a single dot. Now close the quotes here. And what this command does is it basically creates a new Django project. So I'm just going to move this here so you can see the, the app directory here. When we run this, it's going to create a new container out of our Docker image that we built. And it is going to run the app service. So that is the service we define in Docker Compose. Then it's going to run the command, the sh command, Django admin start project app and then dot. And what that will do is it will start a new Django project, a template project, and it will call it app and it will place it in the current directory. So because we set the working directory as forward slash app, that will be in the current directory. And because this app directory here is mapped as a volume in Docker Compose, the file should appear in our project. Let's go ahead and test that by hitting enter on the command. And in a second or two, you should see that it goes ahead and creates our Django project. We'll just wait for that to finish. Okay, so it finished successfully. And now inside our app directory, you can see that we have a sample Django project that has app and then some settings and things like that. So this is just a template Django project that we can use to um, test our deployment. The next thing we need to do is update our settings.py file so that it pulls certain configuration values from environment variables. One of the best ways to configure an application that is running anywhere, so whether it's running on your local machine or the deployed server, is to use environment variables. This lets you customize certain configuration values outside of the source code project. So when you run your application on the server, you can specify custom values that are only stored on the server and not committed to Git or to your Git project. This is useful because you don't necessarily want any passwords or secret keys added to your Git project where everyone can see them. You want them in a restricted file on the server so that they're secure and that you don't have them shared everywhere with everyone who has access to your code. Let's go ahead and do this by opening up the settings.py file inside the app directory. First thing we need to do is import the OS module at the top here. So type o import OS. And this is the module that allows us to retrieve environment variables. Then we're going to scroll down and we're going to change the secret key line here. And you can just delete this secret key that was auto generated by Django. We'll type os.environ.get and we're going to get something called secret underscore key in all caps. And what this will do is it will retrieve the environment variable secret key and it will set it as the secret key inside our Django project. Next, we're going to set the debug option. So debug is an option that we should have enabled when we're debugging locally. But as you can see from the comment here, that was automatically added to the template. You don't want to run it in production. You want debug to be turned off in production. That's because debug mode gives you more information about the background running of your application, things like secrets and different things about the code. It shows you the code running behind the scenes and, and so on. And you don't want that accessible to somebody who is accessing your app on a public server because it's a security risk. So we disable debug mode in production, but we want it enabled when we run our application locally. And the way we can do that is we can replace the true here with bool open the brackets here, then int, open brackets again, os.environ.get, 
and get a value called debug, all caps, I'm going to set the default value to zero. So this comma and zero is the default value if the debug environment variable isn't set. What this will do is working from the inside out, it will start by retrieving an environment variable called debug. And environment variables always arrive as string values if they're set. So even if you put a one or a zero, it's going to be a string value. So we need to first convert it to an integer. So then it will be either a one or zero integer. And then we'll convert that to a bool using the bool function here. And then we should end up with a boolean which we can assign to the debug option to set debug true or false. So if we specify a zero, then it will be false. And if we specify a one, then it will be true. And we default into zero, so we don't need to specify anything and it will automatically be turned off. And I like to do that because then that means you don't have to remember to disable debug mode on production. You only have to remember to enable it on your local development machine. And this is just a bit safer because it means you're less likely to accidentally leave it on in production. Next, we're gonna update this allowed host option. So allowed host is a security feature of Django, which limits access to the application to certain host names. It's a security feature that prevents a certain type of attack that is explained in the Django documentation. I can't remember the actual name of the attack off the top of my head. But if you click on the documentation that I'll link to in the description, it should explain everything about what that is. Basically, you need to specify a list of host names that are allowed to access the application. If you have debug mode turned on, then you don't need to specify the list of host names. It's only when you have debug mode turned off. However, we need to be able to specify the host names when we configure our application. And it's best to do this in a configuration file such as an environment variable configuration file, instead of doing it inside the code directly, because the host name might change on each of the different servers that you're deploying the application to. So we're gonna go ahead and add an extension to this allowed host. So we're gonna extend the current value, which is just an empty value. And basically it's a list of items. So you can have multiple allowed hosts for any given configuration. However, as I mentioned, environment variables don't support different types. Everything comes in as a string. So what we're going to do is we're going to accept a comma separated list of different host names, and we're going to split that up, and then we're going to assign the values to allowed hosts. So let's go ahead and do that now by typing allowed underscore hosts dot extend, and we're going to call the filter function here, which is a built-in function. We're going to filter none and we'll do os.environ.get, we'll get allowed underscore hosts, and then a blank string as default, and then dot split, and then in there we're gonna add a string with a comma in it. Add a comma to the end. And what this will do is it will retrieve the allowed hosts value, or it should be allowed hosts, plural, make sure you get it right, unlike me. So it's gonna retrieve the allowed hosts environment variable, which should have a comma separated list of all of the different hosts that are allowed to connect to the application. We're then gonna call dot split, then with a comma in it, to split that by the comma. So it's gonna split each one up into an individual item and return a list. Then we're gonna filter the list to remove any non values. That's what this filter function here does. And that's just because if you, um, if you split a list by default, there might be a non value either at the beginning or the end. So you wanna just make sure you clear any of those out. We also have a default string here of just an empty string. And that is just so that when we're running in debug mode enabled, we don't need to specify the allowed hosts. Otherwise it's going to give us an error because it will return none by default and you can't split none. You can only split a string. So that's why we specify the empty string here. Now that's done, make sure you save your settings.py file. And then we're gonna open up our Docker compose file again and we're gonna add the environment variables to the Docker Compose file. So the environment variables can be added in a number of ways. One of the ways is to define them inside the Docker Compose file so that they're passed to the Docker container when it automatically starts. So then we can configure our application in a single location. You can add environment variables by adding a new line below volumes and calling it environment colon. And we're gonna add secret underscore key equals dev secret key. It's not that important to specify a real secret key here because this is just for the development server. So it's not gonna be accessible to the outside world. It's purely just for our local development purposes. Below that, we're gonna do hyphen D 
debug equals one, which does, as I explained earlier, sets the debug mode to enabled. And because this is our development server, that's what we want. Now we can save the Docker Compose file. And the next step is going to be to add a database that we're gonna use for our application. So we're gonna add a database by adding a new service here inside Docker Compose. And we need to add a line that is level with the app service because it's gonna be another service. We type db colon image colon postgres colon 13 hyphen alpine. Then environment colon hyphen postgres underscore db equals dev db hyphen postgres underscore user equals dev user hyphen postgres underscore password equals change me. So what this does is it defines another service that is called db and it uses the image postgres 13 hyphen alpine. This image will be pulled automatically from the public Docker Hub repository and it allows us to just simply run a version of Postgres. So we're running version 13 here. And just like we do with our app service, you can configure the database using environment variables. And this is how it suggests you configure them. If you go to the documentation for this Postgres image on Docker Hub. So what we're doing is we're creating a database and it's going to have the database name of devdb the username of dev user and the password of change me. Now you can put a more secure password if you want. It's not really necessary because as I mentioned before, this is just for our local development machine. We're gonna be changing all of this stuff when we actually deploy to a real server. Now what we need to do is add the configuration to our environment. So we configure our database here, but we also need to tell our Django app how to connect to this database because they're running in separate services. By default, it's not gonna know where to connect in order to access the database. So we're gonna do that using environment variables again. So we'll add a new line below this, hyphen db underscore host equals db. And this is the name of the service that we're gonna to connect to. Then we'll do hyphen db underscore name equals dev db and then hyphen db underscore user equals dev user and hyphen db underscore pass equals change me. So it's important that these values match the values that are specified in the environment variables for db. So dev db should be the name, dev user should be the user and change me should be the password. If these don't match, then you're going to run into errors because your Django app is not going to be using the correct credentials to connect to the database. Also, keep in mind that you don't want to add any spaces before the environment variable here because that will actually add them to the real value that gets passed in. You want to make sure you add the equal sign and then put the value straight after the equal sign. Don't have any spaces or quotes or anything around here because that's just going to mess up the configuration. Now below the environment block, we're gonna add another line as depends underscore on colon and then dash db. And what this will do is it will set up a dependency from our app container on the db container. And this basically says two things. One is that the db container should start before the app container. And the second is that there should be a network connection set up between the app and the db container. So if you need to connect to the DB container, the service that is running for that um, container, then you can just use the name of the service as the host name and it will know how to connect automatically. So this is quite useful because it allows us to easily set up network connections in between different services. Okay, now save the Docker Compose configuration file. And now we need to go ahead and actually add the Postgres driver to our Django application. We can do that by opening up the Docker file here. So we'll start with the Docker file. And we need to add a couple more dependencies when we set up our container. So we need to install some packages that are needed for our Postgres driver. To add these dependencies, we need to make some changes to our Docker file. So what we'll do is we're gonna add a line here to the run block. So at the end of line 13, the um, pip upgrade line, we're gonna add a new line below that and we're going to type apk add hyphen hyphen update hyphen hyphen no dash cache and then postgres sql hyphen client and then we're going to add double and sign backslash and we'll add apk add dash dash update 
dash dash no hyphen cache and then dash dash virtual and then dot tmp hyphen deps short for temporary dependencies then and and backslash and then i'm going to just indent here because this is kind of an extension to this line actually we don't need the and and here and make sure you remove that so just the temp hyphen depths and then backslash with no and because I'm going to break this onto two different lines here and it's just easier if um, it's easier to read that way. So we don't want to have a really, really long line with all the dependencies. I'm going to put the dependencies in an indented block underneath here. So I'm going to type build hyphen base, then postgres SQL hyphen dev and then MUSL hyphen dev. And now we can have the double and sign backslash and then below this line here the requirements install line we're going to leave that where it is and below that we're going to add apk del.tmp hyphen depths and 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 then a backslash now that was quite confusing you might want to pause the video and just make sure that you've typed everything out correctly i'll also put a link in the description of the video to the actual source code for this if you actually wanted to go and just copy that from the source code although i do recommend typing it out because it helps to learn it better now i'm going to talk through what changes we made so we basically needed to add some dependencies and there's two different types of dependencies that we add. One is the dependencies that are needed after the Postgres driver is installed and that is the Postgres SQL client. So this installs the client and everything that the Postgres SQL driver needs in order to connect to the Postgres server. So we install that here and we're going to leave that installed in the Docker, contain the Docker image. Then we have these temp dependencies. So these are only needed in order to install the driver. So once we've installed the driver, we can then remove these dependencies to keep the image lightweight. Now this is optional. You could just install them and leave them on there. However, this is not recommended because the best practice when working with Docker is to keep the images as lightweight as possible. Because this means it's a lot easier to clone them, move them to different machines and to run them. And it means that they're a lot uh, more lightweight when they're running on your server, which is good because there's less kind of overhead. There's less memory being used and things like that. So what we do here is we set up a virtual set of dependencies called temp depths. So APK, if I didn't mention it, is the Alpine package manager. And it's what you use to install packages on the Alpine Docker images. So um, the update says to update the package repo for these um, specified dependencies so that it makes sure it pulls in the latest version of them. And no cache means don't set any cache because this is all about making it as lightweight as possible. We don't want it to store any cache on the image that is then saved after we finish building the image. So here we specify the temporary dependencies, which will get installed as part of line 15 and 16. And then we install the requirements.txt file. So this is when our driver is actually going to get installed, because we're going to define it in a minute in the requirements.txt file. After it's installed, we then run apk delete or del, and we delete those temporary dependencies. So this is how it cleans up the temporary dependencies so they're no longer needed on the system or they're no longer stored on the system when we actually deploy our application. Okay, now that we've done that, let's save the file. Open up requirements.txt and we're going to add the driver here for connecting to Postgres. So we're going to type PSYCOPG, the PSYCOPG, to more than equals 2.8.6, comma less than equals 2.9. So save that file. And what this is, is the recommended driver to use with Django when you're working with Postgres database. So it's what Django will use to connect to the database. Now we need to go ahead and modify our settings.py file one more time. And we're gonna modify it to support our database. We wanna configure our database to be Postgres instead of the default here, which is SQLite. So we can do that by just replacing the engine here. So we're gonna change the engine from django.db.backends.sqlite to django.db.backends.postgresql. Then we're going to remove the name here and we're going to add host, all caps, 
And we're going to get the host from os.environ.get. And we're going to get it from db underscore host. And then comma name. And then colon os.environ.get db underscore name. And then comma user. It's going to be os.environ.get db underscore user. And now at the end here, we're going to have password colon os.environ.get and then db underscore pass. So just like we did previously when we retrieved the environment variables by their names, we're doing the same here for the different values that are needed for Django to connect to the server. So if we save the file, and I'm just going to open this side by side here. So you can see in Docker Compose that I have it on the right, each of these different values in the environment variables matches up here. So we have host, name, user, and pass. And here we have host, name, user, and pass. So it's just going to pull the values in from the environment variables and set it up on our database so that Django can connect to the database server. Make sure all of the files are saved. And now we can move on to the next step, which is to create a model that we can use to test with in Django. Before we can create a model, we need to create a new app in our Django project to add the model to. So if you open up the terminal or the git bash or the PowerShell window, whatever you want to use, and you type docker compose run hyphen hyphen rm app sh hyphen c python manage.py start app core. So this will run a command inside our container for the app service, and it will run python manage.py start app core. So we use the Django CLI to create a new sample app. If you hit enter, you should see that it goes ahead and it's going to pull down the Postgres server first because we've added that to our Docker Compose file. But once it's done that, it's going to create the new core app. And we're just going to use the core app to create a simple model that we can use to test our deployment. We're not going to go too in-depth about actually creating a Django project. All we're going to do is create a simple model that has a file field so that we can upload a file using the Django admin in order to test our project. So we got an error here, and that error is because I forgot to do an important step, which is to rebuild the container after we updated the Docker file. So Docker does not automatically rebuild the Docker image every time you change the Docker file. You need to do it manually, and you can do it manually by typing docker-compose build, hit enter, and this should go ahead and rebuild our Docker image using the latest changes that we added to our Docker file. And we'll also see if we made any mistakes or errors in the Docker file when we created it. So I should have done this right after I changed the Docker file. Apologies for that. If you did it already, then you don't need to wait for this because it'll already be done. So you can just, when you run the um, command to create a new app, it should have automatically worked. So we'll just wait for this to finish and then we'll continue. Okay, so the Docker image was rebuilt successfully. As it was building, it reminded me of something I need to explain inside the Docker file that you might not be familiar with. So if you open up Docker file here, um, these dependencies, they I didn't just create them out of nowhere. These are the dependencies that you need in order to install the PsychopG to um, Postgres driver. So I found them through trial and error and through looking on lots of Stack Overflow pages. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of great documentation when it comes to installing this driver on so in the Alpine image. But I found out that these are the dependencies you need. So in order to install that requirements.txt file for PsyCop G2, you need to have the build base Postgres, uh, Postgres QL dev and then the MUSL dev packages installed. And then once it's installed, you don't need them anymore. So we can remove them through the temporary dependencies. Okay, let's go back to creating our image. So I'm going to go back to the terminal. Now that the images are built, I'm just going to use the up key to run the previous commands. I'm going to run the docker compose run rm app sh hyphen c python manage.py start app core, which is going to create a new app in our project called core. If you hit enter, Hopefully this time it should work successfully. Okay, so it seemed that it worked successfully. Let's go ahead and open up our file explorer. 
So the core app is where we're going to create our model. Before we can do that, we need to enable the app in our Django project by opening up app forward slash app forward slash settings.py and just adding it to the list of installed apps here. So if you find around line 39, you should see a list of installed apps. Below, we're just going to add a new line and add the core app. This tells Django that we want to install this app in our Django project so that it can actually be used. And this is important for it to pick up the models and the migrations and stuff that we're going to be creating in a moment. Make sure you save the file. Now open up the core app and we're going to create a new file inside or we're going to create some new lines inside models.py. So models are database models. Each model reflects a different table in our Postgres database. And we're just going to create a sample model that we can use to test our deployed application. So if you delete this comment that says create your models here, and we're going to do class sample with a capital S, and then models.model, colon. And we're just going to have a single field called attachment equals model dot, or models dot file field open and close the brackets here. Okay, save the file. And you might be wondering why this choice of file field, because when you are working with deployed Django apps, the most common issue that people have, the most common challenge that people face is with handling user uploaded media files, because the Django configuration can be a bit tedious when it comes to handling these files. So the files that I'm talking about are files that are uploaded by users as the app is running. So once we start our app, we're going to upload an attachment here to the sample model in order to test the behavior of managing these media files that get uploaded. And again, it's because it's fairly easy to deploy a Django app, but to get this bit right, it's a bit harder and it's often what trips a lot of people up. So that's why I'm specifically creating a model that has an attachment so we can test this in the Django admin. But because we want this to be focused on the deployment, I'm not going to be creating any Django pages or anything like that. We can maybe have a separate tutorial for that. If you want to like and subscribe and leave a comment below, we can get that to you if we create that. But for now, we're just going to be focusing on deployment and handling the media uploaded files. So in order to be able to manage this through the Django admin, we need to add a new line to admin.py. We need to register the model. So we're going to add from core.models import sample, which imports the sample model we just created. And then we're going to do admin.site.register. And we're going to register the sample model. This just makes it accessible in the Django admin so we can browse it and we can actually upload something to it in order to test. Now save the file. And the next thing we're going to do is create our migrations. So if we open up the terminal and we type docker hyphen compose run dash dash rm app sh hyphen c python manage.py make migrations. And what this will do is it will create a migrations file for this new model. So we're not going to go too in detail about migrations because we want to keep this focused on deployment. But it's basically just instructions that Django creates to make changes to the database when you deploy your application. So it keeps track of all the fields you've added, deleted, and all the tables that you've added and deleted. And it helps Django to automatically do that for you when you deploy your application. Now that we've done that, we should have our migration file created in migrations here. So we don't need to do anything with that just yet. The next thing we need to do is add something called a wait for db command. Now there's one issue that often happens when people are using Django with a Postgres database when you're running it using Docker. And that problem is that sometimes when you first start your application, the application starts before the Postgres server is available. So the Postgres container may have started, but it might be initializing some things and setting up the database behind the scenes. So it's not quite ready for Django to connect. But then Django tries to connect and then it crashes and it creates a lot of confusing issues that people aren't sure how to fix. So the way that you get around this is you create something called a wait for db command. And we add this to our Django commands so that we can use it to wait for the database to be available before Django actually tries to connect to the database and do anything with it. So we're going to do that by creating a new file inside uh, core. And there's a few files we need to add. So the first one is we need to add a file called management. And inside management, we need to add a underscore underscore init underscore underscore dot py. And this is so that Python detects this as an actual Python module. 
Then inside management, we're going to add commands. And inside commands, we're also going to add an underscore underscore init underscore underscore dot py. And then we're going to add a new file inside commands called wait underscore for underscore db dot py. Make sure that you have the file structure correct here. So it should be core and inside core you have management and inside management you have the init.py and commands subfolder and inside commands you have init.py and then wait for db. So here we need to add some custom logic. This is some logic that I created in our advanced course on building a REST API and um, using Django and Docker with that. So if you want to take that course, then please check out the link in the description of the video. It teaches you how to build a REST API from start to finish using Django, and it sets it up for deployment using Docker. So we're going to add this wait for DB command here. It's going to add a comment to the top that just says Django command to wait for the database to be available. Then we're going to do import time and then from Psycop G2 import operational error as Psycop G2 op error. Then from django.db.utils import operational error then from django.core.management.base, import base command. Then we'll do class command and we'll base it from base command. Add a uh, doc string here that says Django command to wait for database. And then def handle self, comma, then the asterisk sign args, comma, double asterisks, and then options, and then comma, uh, colon at the end here. And this is the entry point for command. Then self.stdout.write. And we're going to write the message waiting for database, dot, dot, dot. And db underscore up equals false. And then while db underscore up is false try colon scroll up here a bit self dot check database equals and then the default database in case we have multiple databases i'm going to explain each line of this after we type it out so don't worry if any of this doesn't make sense i'm going to explain it in a minute and we'll do db underscore up equals true and then level with the try block here we're going to do accept side cop g2 op error comma operational error and then self dot std out dot write database unavailable waiting one second and then time dot sleep one now level with the while block here i'm just going to add a final line that says st uh, self dot std out dot write self dot style dot success in all caps database ready or database available whatever you want to type okay so save the file and i'll talk you through what this does so basically we're importing some things at the top we're going to need time we're going to need these um exceptions that i'm going to explain in a minute and then this exception here, which is one from Django that I'll also explain in a minute. And then the base command. So base command is the base class for creating custom Django management commands, which is what we're doing here. We're creating a custom Django management command. So the convention for creating a command is you define it inside this file structure. So this is all listed on the Django documentation that I'll link to in the description. You basically structure it like this. This is the name of the command that we're adding. It's in a subfolder called commands, which is in the subfolder called management. And this will automatically be registered as a command because we've structured it like this and we have a class inside it called command that is based on the base command. Then we have this def handle method, which is the method that Django will call when we call the command. So when we use the the um, framework for calling the Django management command. It's going to check to see if there's a handle command or a handle method, and then it's going to pass the command details to that method in order to execute the code. So this is kind of the entry point to start the code for our command. 
We're starting by just doing STD out, which just writes a simple message to the screen. It says we're waiting for the database. Then we have a Boolean here that is DB up is false. So we're going to assume when we first run the command before we've checked, we're going to assume the database is not available. Then we have a while loop. So while DB up is false, so while there's no database, we're going to try here and we're going to try and do self.check and then the database equals default. So the self.check is a method that is available in the base command class that checks to see if the Django app is ready. So we can use that to check if the database is ready. And what I found out through lots of trial and error and stack overflow searching and things like that is that if you call this method here, self.check, before the database is fully ready, so maybe it can connect to the database, but the database isn't fully initialized, then it will throw an error, which will be either the PsychopG20 error, so the operational error from the uh, driver that we're using, or it will throw the error from the db.utils. So this can be a bit confusing, but it throws a different error depending on what stage it's at in the database starting up. So at a certain stage, it might throw the PsychopG2 error. At another stage, it might throw the Django.db.utils error. So to catch both of these errors, we're going to add them both to the accept block here. So if these errors are caught, then it will just write to the screen that the database is not available, and it will just wait for one second, and then it will retry. And then eventually, when the database is available, dbup will be set to true and this while block will stop executing. And then this last line here will run and then we can move on to the next command. Once this is done, we are ready to update our Docker Compose file to actually handle our migrations and to run this command before we start the app. So I'm just gonna close down some of these tabs here just to keep it nice and clean. Now I'm gonna open up the Docker Compose file. So Docker Compose.yaml. And we're gonna add a new line here to the services app block. So the line we're going to add is called command. I like to add it kind of close to the top here. So underneath build, I'm going to do command colon, and then this greater than symbol. And then below that, sh hyphen c, open quotes, python manage.py wait underscore four underscore db, and then double and, and then start a new line here. We're going to do python manage.py migrate, double and sign again, and then python manage.py run server 0.0.0.0 colon 8000. So what this does is it overrides the command that we're using to start the Docker container. So when we run Docker Compose up to start our Docker services, it's going to run this command for our app service. And the command it's going to run is first the wait for db, which will run the code we just added, which basically says wait for the database to be available. Then it runs migrate, which applies any migrations. So any new migrations we have will be applied to the database. And then we run the run server command on port 8000, which creates the development server and allows us to connect to it. So now we can save this file, go back to our terminal or the git bash or the command prompt PowerShell window. And we're going to do docker compose up, hit enter. And if everything has worked correctly, it should start our server and you should see it start here. Okay, so you can see that we got an error here and it says check, got an unexpected keyword argument database. That is because if we go back to our wait for DB command, I made an error here, apologies for that. It should be databases plural. So if you do databases and then you save the file. Now, if you go back to the uh, command prompt or the terminal window, do control C to stop the server. Now we're gonna run it again. Hopefully this time it should work successfully. Okay, you can see that it waited for the database. So it said waiting for database, database ready, and then it performed the migrations and now it started the development server. Now, because we have mapped port 8000, we can go ahead and connect to that development server by opening up our browser, creating a new tab, just heading over to 127.0.0.1 colon 8000, hit enter, and you should see this wonderful landing page for the Django application. So this is just the template landing page for when you haven't created anything in your app yet. So we can see that the development server is now working. The next step is we're going to configure our application to handle 
the static and media files that I was talking about earlier. So if you remember, I was talking about how this always trips developers up when they are first deploying a Django application. The reason is it's a little bit complex because of the way that Django works. So Django, when you deploy it to production, it's recommended that you use something called a WSGI service, which is a web service gateway interface. What that does is it takes requests from the internet, like HTTP requests, and it passes them and runs them as Python code. So it's really good at running Python code and it does it very effectively. However, what it doesn't do so effectively is serving static files. So static files are things like images, JavaScript, CSS, anything that is a static file that isn't run in the Python code. Now it can technically serve these files, however it's not recommended that you do that when you deploy an application because it's a very inefficient way of serving these files. What's recommended is you use something called a reverse proxy. So I'm going to show you a diagram here of how that works. Basically, you put a proxy container in front of the application. And this is called a reverse proxy because it accepts requests and then it forwards them to the correct location. This proxy typically can run something like Apache or Nginx. I like to use Nginx because I like the documentation and I find it works really well with the WSGI server that I use called uWSGI. So here we have the internet and we get um, request sent to our nginx server and what that will do is it will check the url of the request and if the url starts with static so it's a static file it will serve it directly from the file system which will be a shared file system with the app container and if it doesn't start with static it's going to send the request to the WSGI server that is running our django application this means that all of the static files such as the images javascript any binary file anything like that will be served directly from Nginx, which it does extremely well and very quickly. But any other, any other requests will be sent to the Django application and be run as Python code. So this is the most efficient way of handling a Django deployment. And it's the one that's explained in the official Django documentation. So this is what we're going to be setting up. And what we need to do is configure our Django project to store the static and media files in the correct place and then configure Docker to map these volumes and then create an Nginx proxy. So that's what we're going to be doing next. So let's go ahead and configure our application to handle these static and media files. Head over to the source code and we're going to start by opening up the Docker file again. So we need to add some changes to the Docker file here. And the changes that we're going to add is we are going to add a double and backslash here. We're going to add some new lines to this run block. So add the double and sign or the double ampersand and then backslash. And then we're going to type mkdir hyphen p forward slash vol forward slash web forward slash static. And then the and and backslash again. mkdir hyphen p forward slash vol slash web slash media. And then and and backslash. Then chown chown then dash uh, capital R app colon app forward slash vol and then and and backslash chmod then the uppercase R again 755 forward slash vol. So what this does is it creates a new directory. So on line 20, we're using mkdir to create a new directory of forward slash vol forward slash web forward slash static. This is going to contain our static files. So static files are things that we create in our source code project that need to be used for the Django application. So things like CSS and JavaScript would typically be in static files. Then we create another directory called media. So in forward slash vol slash web slash media, we're creating a media directory. Dash P here just says create any subdirectories that need to be created in order to create that full path. The media directory is going to be used for any media files. So this is any file that is uploaded by a user as the application is running. So when the application runs, they might upload something like an attachment, like we're going to demo here, or they might upload a profile picture or something. And this basically um, is a media file. So it's something that is uploaded during the runtime of the application. So stack files are created before we deploy our application in the source code, and the media files are added as we run the application. Next, we have the chown command. So chown, chown, you can call it whatever you want. Basically, this changes the ownership of the file. So when we create it by default, these will be owned by the root user. 
However, we need them to be owned by the application user so it has permissions to add and change the contents of these files. So we do that by assigning app and the app group to forward slash vol and the R basically says recursive. So any subdirectory there, assign it to the app user. Then we set the permissions here and it should be the default permissions, but just to make sure we ensure that the owner has access to read, write and change anything in those directories. Next, we need to make a change to the Docker Compose file. Just make sure you save the file, head back to Docker Compose. And this is kind of an optional change, but just add the volumes line here, do hyphen dot forward slash data forward slash web colon forward slash vol slash web. What this does is it maps this web volume that we just created in our Docker file to the data slash web directory inside our project. So we should see it appear here. And the reason I do this for the development server is just so we can see the files being changed in the directory as we're running the code. So I do this just for testing to make sure I know where the media files are being stored and that they're being stored in the correct place. When we deploy to production, we're not going to be doing this. We're going to be creating a different Docker Compose file that is set up for um, handling these static files in a more efficient way. Now you want to make sure inside git ignore, if it isn't already there, you want to add data to the end. So it just adds this data directory. So add forward slash data. And what this makes sure is that this data volume that we map here doesn't get added to our Git project. So if we upload test images, we don't want it being added to our Git repository. We want it to be separate and excluded from the Git repository because those don't belong in the source code project. Now we can go ahead and update settings.py to configure the locations that we just created for our static and media files. So if you open up settings.py, scroll to the bottom, and you see the static URL here, we're gonna change this to static forward slash static. And then we're gonna add a new one, media underscore URL equals forward slash static forward slash media forward slash. Then we're gonna add media underscore root equals forward slash vol slash web slash media. And then static underscore root equals forward slash vol slash web slash static. Okay, so I'm going to explain what these settings do. Just save the file first to make sure that the changes are saved. And the first two are the URL prefixes that are going to be used when the Django app generates URLs for the static and media files. So static files are anything that's generated for um, a static files such as an image or a JavaScript uh, file or CSS and things like that. Any of those that we use in our Django templates will always be prefixed by forward slash static, forward slash static. And any of the media files that are uploaded by the user will be prefixed by forward slash static, forward slash media. And what this does is it sets up a URL structure that we can then use to configure our proxy to catch all of these different URLs. And what that will do is it will allow us to capture those URLs and forward them to the location where those files are, and then send the rest of the request to the Django application. So we're going to assume if the URL starts with forward slash static, it's going to be a static file that gets served from the nginx proxy. Otherwise, it's going to be a URL route that needs to be sent to the Django application. Then we have these two other lines here, which are media root and static root. And what these are is it sets the root directories in the Django app that we want to store these files. So this is where these files are actually going to be stored on the file system. It's nothing to do with the URLs that get served. This is where they get stored on the file system. So media root says if we upload any media files to the Django application, store them in forward slash vol slash web slash media. And when we run our collect static command, which is a command that collects all of the static files that we need for our application, it's going to place them in forward slash vol slash web slash static. So we can take this location and we can map it to the proxy image, which can then access the files and then serve them directly from the proxy without sending them to the app. And I'm going to show you how you do that in a moment. The catch is that Django doesn't serve the media files by default in the development server. So there's a small change we need to make to the application so that it serves the media files when we're doing the Django development server for the development purposes. So open up the file explorer here and we want to find app forward slash app forward slash urls.py. Then we're going to add some lines to the top here. So I'm going to add 
from django.conf.urls.static, import static, and then from django.conf import settings. Then we're going to add some logic here. So we're going to add if settings.debug colon URL patterns plus equals static settings dot media underscore URL comma document underscore root equals settings dot media underscore root comma. Okay, so you can save that file. And what this does is it appends to our URL patterns the URL mapping for the media files. And it basically means that we can access the media files when we're running our development server for local development. We put it in an if statement to say if settings.debug because we only want this to happen when we're running in debug mode. We don't need it to happen when we're running in production because the Nginx proxy is going to handle managing those URLs. We don't need to manage them in our Django app. Now that we've set up our Django app, we can go ahead and test our local development server and ensure that we can actually upload image or upload files through the Django admin. We'll go ahead and open up the terminal and we need to first create a super user that we can use to connect to the Django admin. So again, we're not going to go into too much detail about this, but basically the Django admin allows you to connect if you have a super user account, which is kind of like a highly privileged account in the Django database. So we can do that by closing down our Django development server, type docker hyphen compose run dash dash rm app sh hyphen c python manage.py create super user. Then hit enter and this should go ahead and create a new super user for us that we can use and we'll just give it a minute and let it run. Here you go. So now it's asking for a username. You can put any username. I'm going to give it admin. And the email address, I'm going to just do admin at example.com. You can specify your own email address if you want, but it's not going to be used for this demo. Then a password. So I'm going to put a password in here. Re-enter the password. Obviously, make sure you remember the password. And then we're going to run docker-compose up. And then we are going to wait for the server to start. Once the server has started, we can open up our browser. And I'm just going to download this image actually because this is what I'm going to use to test with you. You need an image or a file or anything that you can use to test with. So I'm going to just put this on the desktop sample image. And now in the browser, go to 127.0.0.1, then 8000. This will take you to this landing page here. You can do forward slash admin, hit enter. Then it takes you to the admin login. So we're going to use the same username and password we created for the super user. There's admin and then the super secure secret password. And now you can see here that we have inside the page, we have the core samples. So this was the sample model that we created to test with. You click never. And we can click on add to create a new instance of this sample model. And then the attachment here should give you this option to choose a file. So we're going to click on choose file and just choose any, ideally an image file if possible, but you can really use any file. It should be supported. So I'm going to go to the desktop here and then just upload my sample image and now click save. And you can see that it's created a new object and it's created successfully. So if we click on sample object here, you can see that it says currently sample image.png. Now if I open that in a new tab, I'm just going to use a middle, middle click here, you should see that it loads the image correctly. You can see the URL for the image starts with static forward slash media, which matches up inside our settings.py file to the media URL. So any media file starts with static forward slash media. So that appears to be working correctly. If you open up the project, because we mapped the volume, if you look at the data directory here, you should see that the image exists there. So this is what I was talking about when we set up our volume mapping in the Docker Compose file. We map the volume to our project directory just so we can check that it's working correctly. So you can see here the image has been uploaded. And this will be the case for anything we upload. Any sample model that we create with an image should be placed in this directory. 
Now that that is working on our local development server, let's go ahead and configure our project with the deployment configuration. We're going to open up the code and we, I'm just going to commit these changes to git right now, actually. So I'll just do git add dot git commit dash am. And I'm going to type added Django project. Okay, that will give us a nice clean slate to work from so we can see the green highlights for the new files and so on. Now I'm just going to close these files out. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a new directory inside the root of the project called proxy. And this is going to be used to store the Docker configuration for our reverse proxy that we're going to create with Nginx. As I mentioned before, we're going to be creating a reverse proxy using Nginx, and it's going to handle all the static and media file requests and forward the rest of the request to Django. In order to set this up, we need to create a configuration for this proxy. So we're going to do that now. Let's start by adding what's called the uwiski params file. So this is a predefined list of header parameters, and I'll link to it in the resources of the video or the description of this video. And it's basically on the official documentation for the uwiski application that we're going to be using to run our Django app. And all it is is this list here and what it does is it allows us to create a file that maps different headers to the request that's sent to the WSGI server and this is useful when you are forwarding requests because if you ever need to access any of the request headers in Django you want to get the request headers that were made on the actual request to the proxy not the one that the proxy made to the app so if for example you were to try and get the remote address which is the computer that's connecting to your Django app. By default, if you didn't have this, it would give you the address of the proxy and not the address of the user. So you wanna actually define this list here so that we can forward these header values to the actual WSGI service. So copy the contents there and then go back to the Visual Studio Code or whatever text editor you're using. Inside the proxy directory, we're gonna add this file as uwsgi underscore params paste the contents in there and save it. And then we're gonna add a new file called default.conf.tpl. So inside proxy, we're gonna add default.conf.tpl. This is the Nginx configuration file that we're gonna set up so Nginx knows how to handle our requests. So what we'll type here is we're gonna add server and then these brackets, listen, and then the dollar sign, and then open and close these curly brackets and do listen underscore port. And what this syntax does is it allows us to pull in values from environment variables. And we're gonna be running a little script that does that for us when we start our proxy. And I'll show you how to do that in a minute. But basically this says, listen on whatever port we specify here, which is gonna be something like port 8000 or 8080. Then we'll have location forward slash static and we'll set that to alias forward slash vol slash static. So what we do here is we set up a location block to catch any URLs that start with forward slash static and it's going to forward them to forward slash vol slash static. So when we run our proxy, we can map this volume to the same volume on our app container so all of these static and media files are shared and accessible between the proxy and the app. And this allows us to basically forward any request that starts with static to this directory. Inside this directory, we're gonna have another static directory and a media directory. So the rest of the URL gets trimmed off and appended to this. So that's why when we did our settings, which I'll just open up right now, when we, updated our settings, we changed the base of both URLs to forward slash static. So it's static slash media and static slash uh, static. What this does is it means inside our Nginx configuration, we can define one location block that catches all of the media and static files. And because we have static and media at the end of this URL here, it will then be able to retrieve that from the correct subdirectory inside vol slash static. Now we need to add another location block. It's just location forward slash. And this is gonna catch everything else that hasn't been caught by the first location block. 
So with Nginx, they're checked in order. So when a request comes in, it will check the first block. If it matches that, it will just serve it from the alias vol slash static. If it doesn't match the static URL, it will pass it on to the next block, which basically just catches everything else. So this is the block that we want to forward to our WSGI service. So we can do that by typing uwsgi underscore pass. And then the syntax here for the environment variables again, app underscore host, and then colon app underscore port. And don't forget to add the semicolons at the end here, otherwise it won't work. Then include forward slash etc slash nginx forward slash uwsgi underscore params. And then client underscore max underscore body underscore size 10 capital M. And what I like to do is just line them up here so they are all very easy to read. Okay, so save the file. I'm just going to explain what these lines do here. So line nine basically says pass the request to the uwiski uh, pass service, which uh, connects to the app host and the app port that we're going to specify in the configuration. So the host would be the host name where the server is running the app, so the container that's running the app, and the port would be the port number that the service is running on. Then we include the uwiski params file that we created previously. Now, don't worry about the URL here because I'm going to show you when we create our Docker file, we're going to be copying the location of that file to this location here. So that's what where this URL comes from. Next, we have the client max body size and it's set to 10 megabytes. So what this will do is it will set the maximum size of the request that can be sent to the proxy to 10 megabytes. Now, depending on the size of the files you're going to retrieve from your server or the size of the files that the server is going to be receiving from the client, you might want to tweak this. So if you need to upload files that are bigger than 10 meg, then you're going to need to increase this because it's going to put a cap on the maximum file size that is uploaded to the Nginx proxy, which is then forwarded to the application. Next, we're going to create a new script that is going to be used to run our proxy server. So inside proxy, create a new file and call it run.sh. And we're going to start by adding the, uh, it's called a shebang, and it is the um, hash symbol, the gate symbol, then exclamation point forward slash bin slash sh. So this tells the thing that's running the script that we want to use shell. We just want it to be a standard shell script. Don't try and do anything clever like add bash here because it won't work because the Alpine image that we're using is a very stripped back lightweight image that doesn't even contain bash. So if you did forward slash bin slash bash, which lots of people seem to like to do, then that won't work. The script will fail. It needs to be forward slash bin forward slash sh. If you're using a base image that does contain bash, then you're welcome to use bash if you want. Next, we're going to add set hyphen E, and then we are going to type ENV SUB ST, and then the less than symbol forward slash ETC slash NGNX forward slash default dot conf dot TPL, then the greater than symbol forward slash ETC slash NGNX forward slash conf dot D, and then forward slash default.conf. So what this line does is it runs this little command here called env substitute and it basically takes a file and it substitutes all of that syntax here, the, this syntax, so the, the um, dollar sign and then the open and close brackets and whatever's inside is the variable name, it substitutes that with the environment variable matching that name. So if we have an environment variable matching listen underscore port, it's going to replace this with whatever the value of that variable is. So it's a handy way to pull in configuration values at runtime. And this all comes down to the 12 factor app model. So this is when you basically, or one of the components of it is that you should only have one single place where your application is configured. And lots of people like to make that single place the environment variables because it's nice and easy to use when you're running instances of that app. That's what this line does. It basically accepts the template and it outputs the actual file, which will contain the same template script or the same template file, but with these values populated with real values. Finally, we need to start the Nginx server by typing Nginx hyphen G 
and then D A E M O N off colon. So what this does is it starts the nginx service and we pass in daemon off. And what that means is don't run it as kind of like a background daemon or daemon, however you pronounce that word. Run it in the foreground of the Docker container. And this is recommended when you're running Docker because each Docker container should only ever run one application at a time. Ideally that application is at the foreground of that Docker container. So all of the logs that are output to the application get sent straight to the Docker logs. So you can see them in the Docker logs and you can view them and use them to debug issues. Okay, save the run.sh file. And now what we need to do is create another Docker file inside our proxy. So this is different from this Docker file that we created for the app. This is just the Docker file for our proxy. So we'll create a new file, call it Docker file. And we're going to base the image from nginx inc forward slash nginx hyphen unprivileged colon one dash alpine. So what this does is it basically uses the nginx inc nginx unprivileged image from Docker Hub to build our Docker image. And the reason I use this one and not the standard nginx one that would be a lot easier to type is because this runs as an unprivileged user. If you remember when we were creating the app Docker file, I explained that you don't really want to be running your main application in Docker as the root user because that's the most powerful user it has permissions to do anything in the container. So if your application gets compromised, they can access anything the root user can access. However, if you use an unprivileged user, so that's a user that doesn't have root privileges, then the attacker or whoever compromises your application can only access whatever that user can access, which is generally speaking a lot less than what the root user could access. So it just is a bit of damage control if your application does ever get hacked. It just means they can't access the full user. So I found that Nginx Inc. actually has a, a specific Docker file just for this called Nginx Unprivileged. Next, we're going to add label maintainer equals londonappdeveloper.com. Of course, feel free to put your own website or your own email address if you want. And then copy dot forward slash default dot conf dot tpl to forward slash etc slash nginx slash default dot conf dot tpl. Now copy dot forward slash uwisgi underscore params to forward slash etc slash nginx slash u whiskey underscore params. Now copy the run.sh script to forward slash run.sh. So what this does is it copies the files that we created here into the Docker image at the location specified. Um, so these are the um, these are the files that are used inside our run script. Now we're going to go ahead and define some default environment variables. So for our uh, template to actually work, it's going to need values set to all of these environment variables. To save time later on and to set some default variables, we can do that in the Docker file. So there's default values set, so you don't need to specify them. They become optional. If you need to customize them, you can specify them when you run your image or you run your container. But by default, they're already set, so you don't need to change them. So we'll do that by typing env, env, dot, um, sorry, env listen underscore port equals 8,000, then env app underscore host equals app, env app underscore port equals 9,000. So we're going to listen on port 8000. That's the server that the NGNX um, service is going to listen on. Then we're going to use the hostname app, which is the name of the service that's going to be running our container uh, with our Django application. And the app port we're going to be using is 9000. So when we configure our Django app to run using the Whiskey service, we'll set it up to use 9000. And because these are just environment variables, we can always customize them if we need to when we run the application. Now we need to switch to the root user because we need to perform some actions that require root access on the image. So we'll type user root. Next, we're going to run some commands using the run command. So we'll type run mkdir dash p forward slash vol slash static. And then we're using this double and backslash syntax here. It's a bit messy, I know, but it is worth it to save those extra layers of the Docker images. 
and we'll do chmod 755 forward slash vol slash static. Make sure you spell static right, otherwise it won't work. And then double and backslash touch forward slash etc slash nginx slash conf dot d forward slash default dot conf double and backslash ch own chown nginx colon nginx forward slash etc slash nginx slash conf dot d forward slash default dot conf double and sign and then the backslash ch mod plus x forward slash run sh so I'll explain what this does. So first we create the static directory. So this is the static file um, directory that we're gonna be mapping as a volume. Then we use chmod, shmod, to change the permissions of that directory so the owner of it gets to read and write and make changes to it. Then we do touch and we touch this file here. So this default.conf. So because we're gonna be running as the nginx user, which is the unprivileged user that's gonna be running the nginx application, by default, it's not gonna have the permissions required to create this file. So when we run the command in our run script here, so we run this, it's gonna say there's no permissions to access this um, etc slash nginx slash conf dot d slash default dot conf. So what we do here is we use touch, which creates an empty file, so the file exists, and then we change the ownership of that empty file to the nginx user and what this means is that that user can overwrite the contents of the file. So this line here, line five, the env substring line can run successfully. So it's just a little quirk that we need to add in order to follow the best practices of not running our application as the root user. Finally, we're adding chmod plus x, which just gives executable permissions to our run script. That means we can execute it as if it is a binary executable on the machine. Next, we're gonna add a volume forward slash vol slash static. Now this is kind of optional, you don't need to add this, but it's useful for if you do decide at some point to deploy your application to a different service like ECS Fargate. We actually have a course that teaches that in depth. If you're interested in taking that course and learning how to do a full production grade deployment using AWS ECS, then please click on the link in the description of the video to go and take our DevOps course, because we teach all of that in that course. It's like a 14 hour course, which will give way more information than this video, which might be an hour or so long. Next, we're going to go user nginx, and this switches back from the root user to the nginx user. So Docker will use whatever the last user we were switched on when we were building the image. So if we didn't have this line, it would still be as root and then we would be going through all this effort for nothing because we'd run the application as a root user anyway, which is the security risk I was explaining earlier. Finally, we're gonna add CMD and then in these square brackets, forward slash run dot sh. So this says the command to run new containers of this image should run the run dot sh command by default. It just means we don't need to specify in Docker Compose. We simply just need to run the image and it is the default script that will be run whenever we run the image. We can override it if necessary, but we don't need to do that because we're just gonna be running this script to start the application. Now that we've set up our proxy that we're gonna use as the reverse proxy for our application, we can go ahead and configure our Django app to run as a WSGI service so that we can run it in production. So there's a few changes we need to do for that. One is to create a script, just like we did with the run.sh script for our proxy. We need to create the same script for our Django app. So I'm just gonna close these here and inside the project in the root of the project, so not in the proxy directory or the app directory, in the root of the project, create a new folder called scripts. And inside that, we're gonna add run.sh. So it's gonna be called the same name as the proxy script, except it's just gonna be in scripts, slash run.sh. Just like we did for the proxy run script, we're gonna start with the shebang, which is the hash or the gate or the pound symbol, whatever you call it, and then forward slash bin slash sh, then set dash e, and then we're gonna run the commands necessary to start the server. 
So we're going to be doing it a bit different from the commands that we use inside our Docker Compose, which is used for the development server. We're going to be running a different command to run it in kind of a production mode. So it's going to run using a WSGI server instead of using the Django development server. But first we need to run the same commands as we did, which is the wait for DB. So we'll do python manage.py wait for db and then because we're creating a script we don't need those annoying kind of and 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 then the backslash because this is just going to run as a script we'll type python manage.py collect static dash dash no input so what this will do is it will collect all of the static files that are added for each app in the django project so the typical convention is that you would create a folder called static in each of the apps that you have. So you might have, let's say, five or six apps in your Django project. Each one might have their own static directory. And you want to collect all of those static directories and put them in the same place. So we want Django to do that for us. And we can do it with the collect static command, which comes pre-built with Django. We pass in no input because if we don't do that, it might ask us, are you sure you want to do this? And because we're going to be running this script as part of the deployment we're not actually going to be able to say yes to that so we do no input so it just goes ahead and does it and doesn't ask for any input on that command the location that it's going to store the static files in is the location that we define in the settings.py file so this media root sorry not media root the static root static root is the destination for the static file collection so when you run collect static gathers them all of the static files from every app you have installed, places them all inside this directory, which can then be sent to the proxy to be served directly. Now we're going to run python manage.py migrate, which will run any migrations that have been added to the project. If no migrations have been added, then it doesn't do anything. It just checks, and if there's nothing to add, then it doesn't do anything. But if there is, it will run the migrations to make sure the database is updated to the latest version. Next, we're going to do the command to run the uwsgi service. So we're going to be using uwsgi. And to run that, we need to type uwsgi hyphen hyphen socket space colon 9000 hyphen hyphen workers for hyphen hyphen master and then hyphen hyphen enable hyphen threads and then hyphen hyphen module app.wsgi. So what does this do? Well, we run the uwsgi command, which is the command for running uwsgi. Then we do the socket here. So this says run it on a socket on port 9000. And the socket is the type of connection that Nginx can make to uwsgi so that it can actually serve the application. So this is how Nginx connects to our application on port 9000. Then we specify workers. So uwsgi services can be split up into multiple workers. And workers are basically concurrent workers that can accept requests. So you can have multiple workers running in any uwsgi server. And I recommend four. It seems to be the default in most of the documentation. Depending on the type of application and how long your requests take to run, you might want to tweak this. So it is possible in certain deployment setups that you might want to have maybe one worker per container and you want to scale it by having multiple containers. But more likely, you're going to want multiple workers on a container and you just want to make sure that you don't have too many that it causes the container to crash. It all depends how much uh, resource you give to your containers. I think four is about a reasonable amount for this type of deployment. So I'm going to leave it at four. The master says run it as the master daemon. So similar to daemon off in um, the nginx script, what we do is we make sure that the this command runs in the foreground. So it's the foreground command that is running in Docker. So all of the logs and everything are output to the Docker logs so that we can view them when we view our Docker logs. Then we have enable threads, which just enables multi-threading in the uh, application. And then we have module app dot WSGI. So what this does is it says run the WSGI module, um, which is provided by the Django command that creates the project. So when we create a project, you remember that we're working from the app directory. So we specify app.wsgi. This is automatically generated by Django and allows us to actually run our Django app as a WSGI service.
You don't need to specify the .py because it's a Python module, so you always trim off the .py and you just specify the name of the file. Now that we've created this script, we can save it and then we can open up requirements.txt and we're going to add the uwsgi application as a requirement. So we'll do uwsgi more than equals 2.0.19.1 comma less than equals 2.1. So this you can find on the Python package repository and it is the uwsgi application that can be used for running Python applications in production. Now we need to make some minor modifications to our Docker file. And again, this is the Docker file of the app project, the one in the root directory, not the one inside proxy. And we need to basically customize it to copy in our scripts and to add another dependency that is required for installing uwsgi and also to add our scripts to the path. So we'll start by copying scripts in at the top. Underneath the copy lines here, we'll just do copy dot forward slash scripts forward slash scripts. Then inside this big run block here, we're going to find this line here, which is the temporary build dependencies that are needed only for installing the Python packages. They're not needed for um, the long term running of the application just to install it. We're going to find the MUSL dev here and we're going to add space Linux hyphen headers. So through much digging and trial and error, I found that the uwsgi installation with pip requires these Linux headers for it to be successful. So we add this here to the temporary dependencies. And then we can scroll down. And what we're going to do at the end here is we're just going to add anand backslash and then chmod hyphen capital R, then plus x forward slash scripts. So what this does is it makes any script that we copy in via our scripts directory executable. So the R is for recursive. So it just means everything inside this directory, make it executable. And the reason I do it like this is because the chances are, as you work on your application, you're going to want to add many different scripts to your main application. So I add a directory here so that you can just add the scripts to this directory. They will automatically be added to your Docker image. So you don't need to manually copy each script in. You can just put them in the scripts directory. And it could be other helper scripts that you need for your application to run. Now we add these scripts to the path. So we're going to modify this line 27 here. And we're going to do at the beginning. It's important that it's at the beginning because otherwise it will be after the path, which um, probably won't work or that might work but to be consistent it's best to put it at the beginning we'll do forward slash scripts forward slash actually no forward slash just forward slash scripts colon so then we have forward slash scripts is on the path and then our pi slash bin is also on the path so we want to make sure both of these are on the path at the beginning so then when we need to run a script we don't need to specify the full path to that script we can just call the name of the script and it should work now at the end of the file, we're going to add CMD and then in the square brackets here, we're going to add run.sh. This will run the script as the default command for running the containers made out of this image. Okay, so save the Docker file. Next, what we need to do is set up a Docker compose configuration for the deployment. So the way that I like to work when I'm deploying applications like this is I'll have a Docker compose that is the default Docker compose specifically for development purposes. But for deployment, I'm going to have a specific deployment Docker Compose that has some slightly different configurations that make it ideal for a good production deployment. So we can do that by creating a new file inside this directory. I'm going to call it docker-compose-deploy.yml. And some people might like to change this name a bit and maybe make it docker compose prod YML or Docker Compose Dev for the development environment and Prod for the production environment and maybe staging for the staging environment. However way you want to do it, you can create multiple different Docker Compose files depending on the type of deployment you want to create. But I like to just create a simple Docker Compose deploy that is used for all deployments. So the first thing we'll add is the version colon 3.9. So we we'll use version 3.9 syntax and services and then again, I'm just going to change my spaces here to two spaces. This is totally optional. Um, with YAML, I just like to use two spaces instead of four because I find it's a bit easier to read. But if you like four, then stick with four. Then I'm going to add app colon 
build colon and context colon dot. And this is the same as our other Docker Compose file. So basically just use the current directory as the build context. But then we're going to add restart colon always. So this is recommended when you are using Docker Compose for deployment. And all it does is, as you might expect, is it means that the application will always automatically restart if it crashes. So if our app crashes, the service will automatically restart without us having to log onto the server and do it manually. And this obviously helps with the stability and the reliability of the deployed application. Next, we have volumes, colon. And this is going to be a bit different from the volumes we created before. We're not going to create a volume to our directory because we don't need real-time code updating inside our container. What we want to do is build the container each time. So this makes it easier to kind of roll back to the previous version if we need to, because we can find the previous version of the uh, code, rebuild it, and then run the container again. But what we are going to do is we're going to specify a volume, but we're going to use a named volume for the static files. Named volumes, I'm going to show you in a minute, but you basically define volumes in Docker Compose with a specific name. And then instead of mapping it to a specific file for you, it will handle the uh, mapping of that file behind the scenes and it will store it somewhere on the system in an efficient way. So it's a more efficient way of using volumes with Docker Compose. So we'll just type static hyphen data colon forward slash vol slash web and then environment colon and then dash db underscore host equals db then dash db underscore name and now what we're going to do is use that syntax again for pulling in environment variables so the one that we use in our script with the env substring we're going to also use in our docker file it's also supported by docker compose and this is how we can create a configuration file which is kept out of Git source control that we can use to configure the application in production. So we do it by doing the dollar sign and then these squiggly brackets here, braces, db underscore name, dash db underscore user equals db underscore user, and then db underscore pass equals db underscore pass, and then hyphen secret underscore key equals secret underscore key and then hyphen allowed underscore hosts equals allowed underscore hosts now we're going to add depends underscore on colon dash db so these are all the configuration items that we're going to have for our app in production and we're going to retrieve them from an environments variable file that we're going to create in a moment and we're going to depend on the DB service, which we're going to create right now. So below the app service, now DB colon, and we're going to define the Postgres service again. So image colon Postgres, then colon 13 point, uh, or, or sorry, 13 hyphen Alpine, then restart always, and volumes colon dash Postgres hyphen data, colon forward slash var slash lib slash postgres ql forward slash data then environment colon dash postgres underscore db colon uh, equals and then the name of the uh, db underscore name the other benefit to this way of managing them is that we can define the db name once in a file and it's used for both postgres and the app which means we don't have to duplicate the value in one place We'll do dash postgres underscore user equals db underscore user and then dash postgres underscore password equals db underscore pass. So this defines a db service and we're using the Alpine 13 image. We're setting restart always just like we did with the app. And we set a volume here and it's another named volume to postgres data and we're setting it to this line here. So this is different from the one we had for our development server. The reason we do this is because on our production site, if we close the containers down or we delete the containers, we don't want to lose the data from our database. We want it to be persisted in a volume. And the way that you can do that, according to the documentation for the Postgres um, Docker image, 
is you map this path on the container to a named volume. So what this means is that this volume data will always be stored on the server that we're running and it's going to map to the location on the Postgres container that runs the data. So it basically means that we can have consistent database even if we destroy and recreate our service. So that is good because you don't want to lose all of your user data just because you typed Docker Compose down. Then we specify the environment variables again and we take them from the environment variables file using this dollar sign and then the uh, braces syntax here. Now we need to define our proxy service. So below the DB service, we're gonna type proxy colon and then build colon and then context. And this time, instead of the context being just dot, we're gonna set it to dot forward slash proxy, which sets the context to our proxy directory here which is useful for building the proxy. Then we're going to do restart colon always, and then depends underscore on colon, we're gonna depend on app because the proxy needs the app, and the app needs the DB, and it all works in a nice kind of symbi symbiotic relationship. Then we're gonna do ports colon, and we're gonna map port 80 to 8,000. Then we're gonna do volumes colon dash static hyphen data colon forward slash vol slash static. So what we do here is we build from the proxy context. So that's the directory where the Docker file is for the proxy image. Restart always because we want it to restart if it crashes. Depends on app because the proxy needs to be able to access the app via the network so that it can forward the requests to it. Then we forward the port to port 80. So 80 is the default HTTP port. In most cases, you want to forward uh, HTTP applications to port 80. And we're going to forward it to port 8000 in the container. So we can still run our Nginx server on port 8000, but accept requests on port 80 when they come into the proxy. Then we map the volume again. So this name here, this static data, should match the name up here. This defines a named volume. And what this does is it says, we're going to have a shared volume that both the app and the proxy can access. And this is how the proxy is able to serve the static files without bothering the application Python code. So without sending the request to the Django application, it can serve directly from the volume which is shared between the app and the proxy. There's one last thing we need to do to this file and that is define volumes colon and then the named volumes that we create. So sometimes you can add this line first if you wanted, but basically postgres hyphen data colon and then below that static hyphen data colon and they should both be on the same line. And this just defines the named volumes and it allows you to configure them if you want to configure them in one place. So the volume here is static data should match the name static data, which should be the same for the app and the proxy. And the name Postgres data should match the named volume passed to the uh, DB container here or the DB service. Okay, so now we can save that and we can deal with the configuration file. So the way that configuration works is when we deploy the application to the server, we're gonna create a file called .env. If you use the Python git ignore file, you should see that the env file is excluded from it. So if we do git ignore here, inside this file, you should see env is excluded. What this is, is an environment variables file. So it allows us to define a list of file, a list of configuration that can be pulled into these values when we run our application. This means we can keep the configuration outside of the Git repository. So things like the secrets and the passwords and stuff are not committed to Git. They're only stored on the server and wherever else you safely and securely back them up to. The common practice is to create a sample file that is used when new people wanna deploy the application. So this way you know a list of all of the different variables that need to be set when you deploy the application to the server. So you can do that by creating a new file that is env.sample and this should be added to Git but with some dummy values. So with some testing values that aren't actually real passwords. So first we need to define db name equals db name or whatever you want as a test db underscore user equals root user and then db underscore pass equals change me and secret underscore key equals change me 
and allowed underscore hosts equals 127.0.0.1. Now these values could be whatever you want. As I mentioned, they're just a template. So we're not gonna use this. We're just gonna use it to copy a new file so we can then change all of these values on the server that we deploy to. So save the file and we can actually test our deployment locally. Now I know it's running a lot of different Docker things locally because we have our development server and stuff, but I like to test the actual deployment process locally before I actually push it to the server. And this means that I can debug and fix any issues on my local machine before I actually push them to the server. And it just helps save a lot of time. And this is the beauty of using Docker is that it's a consistent environment everywhere you wanna deploy your application. All of the configuration and everything is stored inside the project code. And all you need to do is clone the project to wherever you wanna deploy the application to and have Docker installed and you can go ahead and run the application wherever you are. So we're gonna do that now. And we're gonna start by creating a new file called .env. You should see that it is gray, grayed out because it's excluded from Git. We'll just paste the values in. Oops, that's the wrong values. Let's go copy the values here and paste them into the env file. Save the file and I'm just gonna leave it as default here. So I'll leave it as the default values because I'm just running it locally. It doesn't matter. I'm gonna destroy the environment after anyway. So. Um, we only need to modify these when we actually are running on a real server. So let's go ahead and test that now. We're gonna open up the terminal or the git bash or the um, command prompt or PowerShell, whatever that you use on Windows. And we're gonna run docker-compose-f and then we're gonna specify the name of the file that we wanna use because we're not using the default docker compose file anymore. We need to actually specify the name of it, which is docker compose deploy.yml. Then I'm gonna do down and do dash dash volumes. And the reason I do this is because we might have some conflicting volumes from our Docker compose file that we created earlier. And I wanna make sure we clear all of that out so we don't run into any issues. And this won't normally be an issue because it's very rarely you would actually be testing the deployment um, Docker files on your local machine. Usually this is maybe something you would do once before you actually deploy the application. But we're gonna do this now just to make sure there's no conflict. So doing docker compose down dash dash volumes, just make sure it clears everything, including the volumes. So if you omit dash dash volumes, then the volumes are maintained, which is what you want in most cases. If you do dash dash volumes, it is gonna remove those volumes that you created to store the database and the static files, which you probably don't wanna do in production because you're gonna wipe your database. Um, but for our local machine, just for testing, this is, this is what we're gonna do. And then, Going to run the same command, so docker compose dash f docker compose yaml, and then we're going to type build. So it's going to go ahead and build our Docker images. This will be both our proxy image and also our app image with the latest changes. Now there might be some errors in the code. We're going to find out now whether there was any typos or issues in the Docker files. Hopefully there's not, and then the images should build successfully. If there is, then we should see an error on the screen or something that says. Um, that something failed to install or something. So we'll just wait for that to finish and then we'll continue. Okay, so the images were built successfully. Now we can move on and run the next command, which is the up command. So docker compose-f, docker compose deploy.yaml build, and then instead of build, I'm gonna run up. What this is going to do is it's actually going to start our um, Docker images or start our Docker services in the deployment mode using the deployment YAML file. So this is kind of a simulation as what's going to be running on the server that we actually deploy our application to. You can see that it started by running the application. It applied the migrations. You can see them being applied here. And then it spawned the new WSGI worker. So if you scroll up, you can also see some outputs from the DB. And we haven't got any outputs from the proxy yet, but that's good usually because if there's no errors, then it doesn't output anything until you access it. Let's go ahead and open up the browser and let's navigate to the uh, 127.0.0.1. Now, you're not gonna use port 80 here. So, or you're not gonna use port 8000 because we mapped it to port 80 which is the default port. So if you hit enter, you should see a not found because we haven't actually mapped any URLs. And this is how it should look if debug mode is disabled. So if debug is false, 
then you're going to see this page instead of the standard 404 not found page that you see when running the management uh, development server with debug mode enabled. Now, if you got an error at this, uh, when you run Docker Compose up saying that the port is not available, this is because port 80 might be in use by a different application on your machine. So if you can locate that application and turn it off, that's the best way. Otherwise, what you can do is you can go to your Visual Studio code and just temporarily change this to a different port here from 80 to like 8001 or something. And that will allow you to test it locally, but then just remember to change it back before we continue and deploy to another server. I just say that because sometimes applications can occupy port 80 on your machine and you might not easily be able to locate them unless you're familiar with the network tools and stuff on your machine that allows you to find out where the application is running. Okay, so now we're gonna continue and we're gonna do a test to ensure that we can upload images in production mode. So I'm gonna create a new tab inside my terminal or create a new instance of your terminal or your git bash or your powershell window and then I type docker compose hyphen f and we're going to use the same deploy file run hyphen hyphen rm app sh and then hyphen c python manage.py create super user because we wiped the database and we're using a new database on a different volume, we need to create a new super user in order to test the Django admin. So we're gonna do that by create super user, and then we are gonna just call this one admin, the email address admin at example.com, and then a super secure password, and then add that password again. And now it's being created, we can open up the browser, we can add .admin to the end here, and then we we'll log in with the details we just provided, should see samples here and we're going to create a new sample add sample going to upload the same file i did earlier you save and then open up the sample object click on it to test you should see that it works so we're serving these static files correctly now you will notice that the file does not get added to this directory this is the one from before but now the file is not being added to this directory if we actually delete this directory and we delete the file and then you refresh, it's still there. And that's because instead of the directory that we mapped with our original Docker Compose file, we're actually mapping it to a volume which is kind of hidden on the system that is not inside our directory. And that's how it's gonna run on the production environment. And you can clear that by just doing Docker Compose and then um, specify the file for deploy and then down. And then if you do the dash dash volumes, it will clear those volumes as well. So I'm happy with the deployment. It all seems to be working as expected. Now let's go ahead and actually deploy this to an AWS server. The first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna to wanna to head over to the AWS free tier and sign up for an account if you don't already have an AWS account. So I'm gonna assume from now on that you do have an account. If you don't have an account, please go over to the AWS free tier site and sign up for one of the free tier accounts, which is kind of like a 12 month free tier trial that gives you access to some of the AWS resources for free. Once you have that, I recommend that you set up an IAM user and things like that and log into the console using that IAM user. I'm not gonna cover that in this tutorial because it's quite a long winded process. And if you want me to create a, another tutorial on how to do that, please leave a comment in the comments below and I will do that. So let's go ahead and head over to the console so it's actually console.aws.amazon.com. Once you sign up to AWS, you should have all of this information given to you via the emails that you register with. Once you're logged into the AWS console, you should be able to choose services and EC2. EC2 is a service that allows you to create virtual machines that you can use to run code like the one we're gonna be deploying in this project. On the left-hand side, you should be able to see the key pairs under the network and security option. So if you click that, and then we're gonna click on actions, import key pair. And I'm gonna give it the name, which is the name of the user and the machine that my key is from. So demo MBP. So that means demo MacBook Pro. And what this is, is the SSH key that we're gonna to use to authenticate with our server that we create. 
Now, we're not going to be covering the details of SSH authentication in this video. I assume most of you will probably be familiar with it already. If not, then there's a great tutorial in GitHub that explains how to use SSH authentication that you can use to learn how to use it and then you can just come back to this video. If you do want me to create a specific video about that, then please let me know in the comments. What we need to do here is paste the contents of our public key. So I'm gonna retrieve that by opening up my terminal and doing cat um, and then this squiggly line, the home directory for SSH slash and then ID RSA dot pub. So this is the public key that we can share with the internet to allow us to connect to the server with our private key. So we should have already had these generated on our machine. If not, as I said, there's lots of guides on the internet that show you how to create SSH keys. So we're gonna paste that in here. And I'm gonna do import key pair. And this is gonna import the pair, key pair into our AWS account. So this will put the public key in our AWS account so we can use that to create virtual machines that we can then connect to with SSH. Now we're actually gonna create a virtual machine. So we'll head over to EC2 dashboard and we're gonna click on launch instance and launch instance. And we're taken to the page where we can choose an AMI. So an AMI is basically an operating system that our virtual machine is gonna be based off. I like to use the Amazon Linux 2 AMI because it is optimized to run in AWS EC2 servers. It's also eligible on the free tier. So we're gonna choose that one by clicking select. And then we're gonna choose the instance type. Now this is where you can get charged a lot of money for creating different instance types. So you can see here this T2 micro is the one that's eligible in the free tier. But it's probably not gonna be powerful enough if you have a real application with lots of users. When I say lots, maybe if you have 100 users a day or so, you might be okay with the T2 micro, depending on what your application does. So if it's very process intensive, then what you basically need to know is that the more that your application does and the more users that you have, the larger the instance you're gonna need. But for this tutorial, we're just gonna use T2 Micro because it's a free instance. The Generally, the larger the instance, the more you're gonna be charged per month. So it's important to look into the costs, figure out the costs on the AWS cost calculator before you choose an instance because some of these can cost quite a lot of money, um, like hundreds or thousands per month. So we're gonna do the free tier eligible one and I'm gonna click on configure instance details. This page, we can just leave everything as default and we can click add storage. Now this allows you to increase the amount of storage assigned to the virtual machine. Just like with the instance size, you are charged more for the more storage that you use. So I believe if you leave it as eight gigabytes, then you won't be charged in the free tier, although that might not be correct. So please verify that before committing to this. Um, eight gigabytes is what I'm gonna use because it's the default value that is set up here. So I'm just gonna use eight gigabytes, but if you have an application that's gonna need more data, then you might need to increase this to something higher like 20 or 100 gigabytes because eight gigabytes can be used up quite quickly, especially if people are uploading files and stuff to your application. I'm gonna click on next, add tags and then next configure security group. And this allows us to configure the access to the machine. So you can see there's already a rule here that allows access on port 22. What this does is it allows SSH access to the machine. So this is so we can connect to it and administer the machine in order to install and run our application. I'm gonna click add a rule and I'm gonna add a new rule to allow HTTP and that's on port 80. And then leave everything else as it is and click review and launch. And then we are going to scroll down here and click on launch. It's gonna ask us which key pair we want to use. So make sure you choose the key pair we added earlier in the dropdown here. So this is important because this is the only way that you can connect to the machine once it's been created. If you have this wrong or you don't specify the right key, then you won't be able to connect to the machine. You're gonna to have to destroy the machine and create a new one uh, with the correct key pair. So once you've selected that, you need to click this box saying I acknowledge that you have access to that key. And then you can click launch instance. This is gonna go ahead and create a new instance in AWS. So you can see it says your instances are now launching. If you click view instances, it will take you to the page with a list of instances. And you can see our instance is still pending. So we're gonna wait a couple of minutes until that instance is started and then we're gonna continue. Once your instance is running, you should see this instance state running here. If you click on the uh, checkbox here, 
and then you drag this little bit up here, you can see the, all the details for the instance that's running. So the instance is like a real server, but it's a virtual server that's running on AWS. So it has a public IP address that you can use to connect to, and it also has a DNS address that you can use to connect to the instance. We're going to copy the DNS address, and then we're going to open up our terminal or the uh, Git Bash or Putty. If you're on Windows, you might want to use Putty to connect to it. And we're going to connect to the server typing ssh ec2 hyphen user, which is the default user added to the Amazon Linux 2 images at, and then the we're going to paste the host name. So that is the IPv4 DNS address here. Then we're going to hit enter. And it might ask you to confirm the fingerprint and you can type yes. It only asks that the first time you connect. And now we're connected to the server. So we can actually perform actions on the server to set up the dependencies that we need to deploy our application. And the dependencies that we need are Git and Docker, basically, because once you have those two, you can run the application. So we're going to start by installing Git. We'll type sudo yum install git hyphen y. The hyphen y just says if it asks any questions, just automatically say yes. So you can hit that and it will go ahead and download Git and install it on the machine. And we're going to use this to deploy our code from GitHub to the machine. Then we're going to type sudo Amazon hyphen Linux hyphen extras install docker hyphen y. So this is going to add docker to the machine. Now that Docker is installed, we need to enable it so that it starts with the machine when the machine starts. So we can do that by typing sudo systemctl enable docker.service. This enables the Docker service so it starts automatically when we reboot the machine. Then we can type sudo systemctl start docker.service, which just starts the service so that we can get it started without having to reboot it just now. Now we need to add our user to the Docker group so that our user has the permissions to run applications using Docker. So we'll do that by typing sudo user mod hyphen A and then capital G, which is like add group, I believe, and then Docker EC2 hyphen user. So what we do here is we're adding the EC2 user to the Docker group, which will give it the permissions it needs in order to run Docker containers. You hit enter. And then what we need to do is install Docker Compose. So Docker Compose can be a bit interesting to install. If you head over to the installing Docker Compose page, which is docs.docker.com forward slash compose slash install. And if you scroll down and you click on Linux, it actually has a command here that is used to install it on Linux. So this is the command we're going to be using to install. We need to copy the contents of this, the full line, make sure you get it from start to finish. Go back to the terminal or the git bash or the, or the PowerShell and hit enter. And it will go ahead and download the uh, Docker executable to the machine. So it just basically downloads it off the internet and stores it somewhere on the server. Now we need to make it executable by following this step two here, copying this command, paste that there, and then it makes it executable. So now we can run Docker Compose. First, we just need to log out the machine and log back in so that the group that we added our user to gets applied. So it doesn't get applied until you log out and log back in. We'll type exit. And then I'm going to push the up key to just use the same SSH command to connect to it again. Connect to the server again. And now we are connected to the server and it should have all the dependencies that we need in order to run our project. The next thing we need to do is make sure that our project code is updated and pushed to GitHub. Because we're going to be deploying from GitHub, we need to make sure GitHub has the latest version of our code. I'm just going to go back to the running service here, and I'm just going to push Control C to close the service down. And once that's done, I'm going to do git add dot to make sure all the files are added, then git commit hyphen am, and then um, finish project, I'll type. And then git push origin. And this is going to push all the latest code up to GitHub. Then we need to head over to our GitHub page. So you want to make sure you, you're logged into GitHub and you want to click on the project that you are deploying from. And this step is optional if you are using a public repository. 
A public repository means that the repository is publicly available so everyone on the internet, including our server, can access it in order to retrieve the code. However, in most cases, you'll probably have a private repository because if you're creating an application that isn't open source, then you're gonna to wanna to protect that code from the internet and not make it publicly available. So in that case, we need to set up something called a deploy key. So we can do that by heading over to settings on the project and then the option to create a deploy key should appear. And then we have deploy keys. So here we can add a deploy key. So what we need to do is go back to the server, generate a deploy key. So use the SSH terminal that's logged into the server. And we can generate it by typing SSH hyphen key gen hyphen T E D two five five one nine hyphen B and then four oh nine six. What this will do is it will generate an SSH key on the actual server so it can authenticate with GitHub. So there's two different keys at play here. One is our key on our local machine that allows us to connect to the server. Now we're setting up another key that allows the server to connect to GitHub. And it's best practice to not use the same key for both of these things because you should only really have your own personal key on your own machine. Your server should have its own key. So then if you need to disable access to that server, you can do that easily through the GitHub console. So once you type that here, enter, and you can just leave it in the blank location or the default location. Now you can type a passphrase. This is an optional passphrase that you can use um, or that you would need to use every time you deploy updates to the server. The chances are if somebody already has access to the server, they can access the key. Therefore, they can access the code that's already on the server. So I don't think it's that necessary to add a passphrase for this particular key. But somebody might disagree. If you do, then explain why in the comments. I'll be interested to, to learn from you why. It is an added layer of security if you are working on some really secure software or something like that. For convenience, I'm just going to leave this blank so I don't need to type a deployment password every time I deploy. Now that the key's been generated, I can output the public key by typing cat, then the squiggly line here, forward slash dot SSH, forward slash ID underscore ED25519 dot pub so this will give us the public key so we can copy that now go back to our github page here click add deploy key and give it the title ec or aws deployment or something that makes sense to you and then paste the contents and what this does is it adds read only access to this particular key unless of course you check this box to allow write access but for a deployment key typically you would never need to give write access. Like the, the server doesn't need to add code to the Git repository. It just needs to retrieve the code so it can run it on the server. So we're gonna leave this unchecked and click add key. And then I'm gonna go ahead and add the password uh, for my GitHub account. So I just need to remember what that is. Paste that and click confirm password. Okay, and now the key is added. Now that the deploy key is added, we can go ahead and actually clone and run the service. So let's go back to the homepage of the project and we're gonna click clone and we're gonna use the SSH URL. Now, if you are cloning a public project and you didn't add the deploy key because you just wanna have a publicly available project, then you would use the HTTPS URL. So, but we're gonna be using the SSH URL. It's important that you choose the right one because if you use SSH but you haven't set up authentication, then it's not gonna work. And if you use HTTPS, you can't authenticate with the same SSH key. So that isn't gonna work there. So if you wanna deploy using the deploy key that we just created, use the SSH URL. Head back to the server. And we're gonna type git clone and then the name of the URL. We'll type yes to add it to the fingerprint. And then the project will be cloned. So now if we type ls, you should see the project here on the server. If you type cd Django and then tab, it should auto complete and you can switch to that directory. Now what we're gonna do is add the configuration. So I'm gonna type cp and then .env.sample and then copy it to .env. Then I'm gonna do dot, uh, .vi and this is the editor that I'm using. So if you're familiar with vi then use vi if you're familiar with um, nano or a different text editor then use that use whichever text editor you're familiar with uh, because you want to open up the file with a text editor 
and you want to make the changes to the file. So I like VI, so I'm going to do vi.env, db name, and I'm going to add the db name here. So let's just call it app root user. Let's call this app root user. DB password will be something like super secure password one, two, three. And then the key is usually random, a string of random characters. So you can actually generate a Django secret key. And there's a bunch of generators online. It's just a random string of characters that's used for Django. Now allowed hosts, you need to change this to the host name of the server that you're using. So if you have your own host name that you're gonna to point to the server, then you will use that. In our case, we are going to just use the host name that was given to us when we created the server. So you need to copy that again, head back to the terminal and paste it in. You can add a comma separated list of host names. So host name two, host name three, and each one will give access to the application on that host name. So if you have multiple host names, you can specify them all here. Now we're just using one, which is this one that was given to us by AWS. So we're going to save the file. And you do that on VI by typing escape, then colon, and then WQ for write quit. And that's all the configuration we need to do. We're now actually finally ready to launch our application. So we can type docker compose hyphen F, docker compose deploy.yaml. It's important to specify the deployment YAML file up hyphen D. This runs the application in the background. So it'll, it'll be running on the server in the background. Hit enter. Docker will then pull down the dependencies that are needed and it should run our application. So the first time you run it, it's gonna take a minute because it needs to download and build the containers. Once that's done, it should be a lot faster in the future. Once it's done, you should be able to access the application on the URL that we gave for the public DNS. So if you copy the URL here on AWS, open a new tab, paste it in, you should see the not found because we haven't actually defined any um, views or anything templates. But if you do forward slash admin, you should see it takes us to the admin page and it has all the CSS and everything loaded because we can see the styling and everything. So that means the static files are working. Now let's go ahead and create a super user for us to test with. So I'm going to use the up key to run a similar command as we did before. But this time we are going to change it to do a run hyphen hyphen rm app sh hyphen c python manage.py create super user. And we need to run this again because we are on a new server with a new database. So we have to create another super user. I'm going to call it admin, email address admin at example.com and the password. Okay, so now I'm going to log in with admin and then the password. And you can see that we logged in here. I can go ahead and create a new sample model, which contains some kind of image. Save that. Click on the sample model and you can see that it is serving the static files correctly. If you need to inspect the logs on the server, you can do that by typing a command that starts with the docker compose hyphen F, um, docker compose deploy, and type logs. So what that will do is it will share all of the latest logs that have been output to the screen. And if you need to update the code, then what you would do is if you're updating your application, you would make the changes on your local machine, then you would commit them to Git and push them to the Git repository. And then you would do Git pull origin on the server, which would pull down any changes. And of course, we haven't got any changes, so it says already up to date. So once you do that, you'll pull the latest code down. Then you would do docker compose hyphen F, then the uh, deploy file, build, and then the name of the service, so the app service, that would go ahead and rebuild the container with the latest version. And then you run, um, instead of build, you would run up hyphen hyphen no hyphen depths hyphen D app. And what this will do is it will start a, or it will replace the current app container with a new version of it, but it won't 
affect any of the dependencies. So it won't shut the uh, database down or the Nginx proxy down in order to do that. It will just update it in place. So that's how you deploy a Django app to AWS EC2. So it's a very quick and dirty way of doing it, even though the video took a long time. It's a lot shorter than our 14 hour course that teaches how to do it in a production grade environment where you would define all the infrastructure as code, set up automation and set up things like automated workflows so that when you push your code to Git or you push it to your uh, GitLab instance, it automatically builds it and deploys it to an environment. So it's a lot quicker than doing that. It still takes some time, but once you've done it a few times, it should be pretty fast. And most of this was uh, creating the actual application for us to deploy. Um, I wanted to do that just to show you how to create and deploy an application from start to finish. I hope you found this useful. If you have any feedback or comments, then please leave them in the comments below. So if you have a better way of doing this or you think something could have been done different, then please leave them in the comments. That way we can all learn from each other. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next lesson.